7 o'clock, we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, board meeting tonight. Um, can I get a motion to approve the agenda for March 16, 2023? I don't need Second, Brenner. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll go ahead and move to item 3.1, the student representative announcements. Michael, you Mike, good evening, everyone. <coughs> good to see so many people here today. Um, since our last meeting, the high school closed out Black History Month with a very engaging program that highlighted the contributions of the Divine Nine fraternities and sororities to the Black community, as well as this uh, debuted U-City Step Team. Additionally, we were visited by the Parkway School District Step Team as they graced us with a phenomenal step performance. Um, that same day, members from the girls' basketball team, as well as a few other students, including myself, helped Flint Park celebrate Black History while reading to um, their various classrooms during their annual African American History Read-In. This was especially special to me because I got to read in my sister's class, who, to my surprise, was actually in my fifth grade classroom. Additionally, the high school has begun to welcome the class of 2027 into our building as high school students led tours today, along with answered questions from the eighth graders as to what they can expect when coming to high school. Similarly, the high school counselors have begun their process of transitioning parents and students to the high school with their Gearing Up for High School webinar, and they will soon begin help, uh, to help incoming freshmen select their courses for next school year. The seniors have continued to excel with college acceptances and scholarships, as we are now at a scholarship total of over $11 million. And <laughs> Special shout out to Michaela Flowers, who is in the audience, who recently was admitted to Vanderbilt on a nearly full ride scholarship. <laughs> which helped to push us over that $11 million threshold. Winter sports concluded a couple of weeks ago with many of our student athletes being recognized in their conference for their outstanding ability in sportsmanship. Jared Martin for wrestling, Eris Cunningham Peoples, Jael Green, Veronica Griffin, and Khalees Hampton for girls basketball, and Lee Williams, Myel Taylor, Jaden Creighton, and Kobe Jones for uh, boys basketball. Finally, spring sports are finally underway. There has been a tremendous growth in terms of numbers and ability within our spring sports, and their full schedules can be found on on arbiterlive.com. Also, special shout out to our athletic trainer, Miss Ashley Jenkins, as March is National Athletic Trainer uh, Month. And I also just wanted to take a minute to thank the school board, Dr. Hardin Bartley, and our school community for always keeping student well being, student growth, and student development at the forefront of our work here in New City. I had the opportunity to go to a school board meeting for another district, advocating for them to implement a student representative position to their school board. Um, and that experience left me feeling very grateful to be in a community in a school district where um, that, that I am in. I feel like oftentimes we lose perspective on how truly blessed we are in this school district where we are not fighting for our education, fighting for our safety, and fighting to be heard by the admin in our district. So I just wanted to applaud you all and thank you for always keeping students at the center, and that concludes my announcements. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to item 3.2, the superintendent's announcements. It's always difficult to go after Michael. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for continuing to raise the bar. <laughs> so we're near the home stretch of the 2022-23 school year. And there is so much to look forward to in the weeks to come. I want to also congratulate the class of 2023 um, for their um, successes in approaching $11 million in college financial aid and scholarship offers. This also includes almost full rides to places like Boston College and, yes, Vanderbilt. <laughs> I am so proud of them, and I'm also proud of the counseling staff who work in support of our students each and every day. I also want to thank the volunteers who run the amazing District Boutique. 
This week, they held a prom pop-up shop for seniors to help students handpick stylish outfits at no cost. Prom is scheduled, prom is scheduled for April 29th at the Mailer Ballroom in the Central West End. Class of 2023 parents, you will be hearing about commencement. It's coming. And other celebrations very soon. Last Saturday, our One You City parent organization did it again with another event that really highlighted community and inclusion and a lot of joy, thanks to their world tour inside the gym at Brittany Woods. I am so grateful for this intentional work that makes our district stronger. We still have three more community engagement meetings scheduled in the weeks to come. Persian Elementary and Barbara C. Jordan Elementary Schools will have individual meetings on March 28th at 5.30 p.m. The middle and high schools will have a joint meeting on April 12th at 6 p.m. in the high school library. We will set some time in those meetings to discuss our APR results as well. Please check the district website to pre-register. We do have early dismissal tomorrow. And yes, students and teachers have a well-deserved spring break coming. Next Monday is Friday. Please remember that our district offices will be closed on Friday, March 24th. We will see everyone back at school on Monday, March 27th. Also, please keep an eye out for Pride. This is it, hot off the press. You should have it in your homes very soon. The district news magazine. It should be in your mailbox starting actually today. Also, don't forget to vote on Tuesday, April 4th. We have um, three board seats uh, for the school board, school governance. School boards are very important to the work that we do here in our district. So please be sure to exercise your right to vote. I wish everyone time to recharge, reflect, and to just simply be with family and friends. There are so many special events coming this spring. Let's hope for warmer weather so we can feel like spring <laughs> in the days to come. That concludes my announcements. Thank you, Dr. Hart Farley. And we'll go ahead and move to uh, item 4.1, the Field Hockey National Academic Squad. <coughs> uh, the National Field Hockey Coaches Association's High School National Academic Squad recognizes high school field hockey senior and junior athletes based on their cumulative, unweighted grade point average through the first quarter of the school year. University City High School seniors Michaela Flowers, Delaina Kellogg, and Lucy Rhodes, along with juniors Madeline Provence, Province, Province. Province, and Isabella Wright were recognized as academic squad scholars, with four of them gaining an additional distinction of having a GPA of 3.9 or above. As members of United Field Hockey, a collaborative merger of students from University City, Fernwood, and Rosati Khan High Schools, the team was also recognized in the fall with the Mike Winkleman Spirit of the Game Award. The University City Board of Education and District Administration are proud to recognize these five stellar University City School student athletes and their coach Marissa Davenport Shepherd for their outstanding scholarship and team accomplishments. stay away long <laughs> so she's been back and has always done a phenomenal job with our program so I did want her to just share a few words about our scholar athletes yeah. they're all scholar scholar athletes yes so that's important um, all right well I've been I was a graduate of U City so I've been here um, in the district since 1980 um, and it was it's always been a pleasure to coach I've been coaching since 2005 and I've had these lovely people on my team um, many since sixth grade, and there was a little bit of a hiatus in there, um, and there was COVID, um, but it's been such a pleasure to have everyone back on the field, and part of the, our community, um, these four that are here, and Elena um, as well, who's not with us today, um, are just great leaders. Um, they academically, obviously, but also just um, their leadership skills shine on the field. We have several of them that have helped with middle school. We do summer camp. We have a fall clinic for younger athletes. Um, and they're just ever present and enthusiastic and, and just a great role model for their younger, their younger athletes. So it's a always a pleasure to, to be able to honor them even more than um, the appreciation I have for them every day. So I'm going to let your coach give you your certificate because that's me to give it to you. Isabella Wright. Thank you. 
get a group photo in just a moment. Yeah. Okay. Lucy, oh, no. Rose. citizen input concerns and is allowed at a period of 30 minutes at the beginning and end of each meeting for the citizens and staff to address us. We ask that remarks be limited to four minutes and that you please speak to the issues. The board cannot discuss personnel matters or individual student concerns in public sessions. The board and superintendent will not immediately respond to the questions prior to conducting the inquiry. However, responses will be provided by an appropriate person as soon as possible. Citizens who wish to make a comment may do so during the citizen comment section. No comments will be taken from citizens during the meeting. Citizens need to indicate their desire to speak and state the topic of their comments on the sign-in sheet located at the door. Comments should be limited to four minutes. No individual will be permitted to speak more than once during the board meeting. It is our intent to conduct a meeting of it in a manner that is at all times respectful to our students, staff, community members, and fellow board members. Julie, do we have any comments tonight? There are no citizen comments this evening. All right. We'll go ahead and move to item 6.1, the approval of the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda item 6.1 through 6.12 as listed? Second, McDougal. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, with that, we'll move to item 7.1, the school board recognition month and resolution. Communities across the state will honor the dedicated service of their local boards of education during March 
in honor of School Board Recognition Month. The goal is to build awareness and understanding of the important function an elected board of education plays in communities and schools. All Missouri citizens are asked to recognize the important contributions of these men and women and focus attention on the vital role these public officials play in the education of Missouri's children. Missourians benefit every day from the dedicated energies and countless hours devoted by a group of more than 3,600 men and women from communities across the state. These public servants are elected by local constituents and do not receive compensation for their tireless efforts. They are the local school board members of Missouri. A system of quality public education is essential to the future of our state and nation, and the people of Missouri have a long tradition of support for public education in our local school districts, and local school boards are the ultimate expression of the unique American institution of representative governance of public school districts, and local school boards acting on behalf of and in close connection with the people in their communities chart the direction of education in their communities, and local school boards serve as the key community advocate for children, youth, and the public schools. Let it be known that March is School Board Recognition Month in the School District of University City, and we urge all community members to recognize the School District of University City Board of Education for its commitment to providing our students with the finest possible education. have the elected individuals, but we also have student representatives who serve on our board. So I also want to thank Michael Simmons for his leadership, his insight, and for bringing his voice to this process. We do have a token of appreciation for your testimony. <laughs> so um, we do have a token of our appreciation for each of you board members. to be proactive 
in utilizing the time between now and the end of the school year for uh, teacher development and to become more acclimated with the use of the resource so that we can have full implementation in the fall. Um, every six years or so, we go through what is called a curriculum adoption process. We leverage the insight and expertise of some of our wonderful teachers in the district, as well as uh, our curriculum coordinator for mathematics. And we really take a look at our current curricular resources to ensure that it still meets the needs that we feel need to be met in um, our endeavor to have, provide a modern, rigorous um, learning environment and learning curriculum for kids. In examining our current math curriculum, we notice some opportunities to do better. And so we are exercising this process in order to find a resource which will allow us to do just that, particularly along the lines of equity and providing more equitable experiences for every single student in our district. Um, ben Belloff and Sam Llanos are here from the actual mathematics co uh, curriculum committee and they are going to walk you through uh, the process that was used, the individuals who participated on that committee, and then ultimately why, provide a rationale for why we are recommending the resource we are recommending for approval. So I will turn it over to the two of them. Thank you, Dr. Bell, and good evening, board members. Um, as Dr. Bell mentioned, we went through a pretty in-depth process with our curriculum review and then started the curriculum process. It started in August of this year during our PD day, our first PD day back with the entire secondary team together, along with our partners from Attune, um, where the department came together to really talk about the criteria we're looking for as we move forward with our instruction. And from that full day PD, uh, then a working group was formed that met monthly, or six times, um, not necessarily monthly, we had a couple months where they met twice in one month, um, on Wednesday mornings, so during the school day, um, during their planning times, during their department meeting times, where we spent time really surveying our stakeholders, researching high quality instructional materials, um, and then we started to narrow down what we were looking at. So we started with six curriculum products, and then we narrowed it down to two based on our criteria. Uh, and then from the two, we spent about three months running trials with those through two um, in our Algebra class, our Algebra 2 class, our Math 8 class, and our Math 7 class. During those trials, we recorded videos of the teachers teaching and then came back and talked about them based on our criteria. We did live learning walks during that time. And then we also asked a lot of questions during that time, um, not only to our vendors that were helping us, but then within as well. The team consisted of representation from both schools, so Brittany Woods and the high school, which included teachers such as Sam, our two math coaches, as well as administrators, um, along with myself and our partners from Attuned. Our last session um, was actually the snow day that we had in January. It was scheduled for the snow day, and the team decided to still meet. So we met virtually because that was our day we were coming to a consensus. We were down to two, and we knew our timeline, and we wanted to stick with our timeline that was set, so we met virtually at 8 o'clock in the morning on that snow day. Everyone committed to it. Um, and then from there, the consensus was made, and unanimously, we landed on Carnegie Learning. And so Carnegie Learning is going to be, is what I'm coming to you tonight, today, um, presenting, that is the curriculum we'll be using in all of our math through Algebra 2, excuse me, math six through honors algebra two trig. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for having one curriculum that runs vertically like that. It brings both schools together for professional development, as well as troubleshooting and really thinking around giving feedback to each other. Um, I'm excited about that announce, like announcing that, that we've landed on Carnegie, and then I'm also excited that we can start professional development early, pending your approval. Um, using contracted days that are still within the school year will afford us a lot of prep time before waiting until August um, to really dig deep and learn the curriculum that we are going forward with. And not only that, we've also, um, I've uh, uh, found money through some grants that I can afford to take teachers to summer PD um, out of state through Carnegie Learning National Institute. So it's not only internal time in, in April, but also ongoing and starting again before August. So 
So with that, I would just like to open the floor if there's any questions for myself or for Mr. Yanos or Dr. Bell. So this is an action item. Uh, so can I get a motion to approve the adoption and purchase of the Carnegie Learning Curriculum for Professional Development Supports for Math 6, Math 7, Math 8, Algebra, Geometry, Honors Geometry, Algebra 2, and Honors Algebra 2 Trigonometry in the amount of $267,000, $120 to be split over a two-year payment plan to include um, five years of digital content, one year of professional learning through Carnegie, and one year of edu, edu elastic Enterprise License. Um, that's the so moved by Mark. Second by Suda. So do you have any questions or comments? I, I have a question. Um, Dr. Bell, you, you mentioned um, that this, curric this new curriculum helps to further bring about equity in math. Mm -hmm. I just had a question, what does equity in math look like and how does, how is that going to benefit our students? And then I had a second question as well. Um, does, how does this curriculum take into account impact that the pandemic has had on math and, and math and students uh, so what we um, when we look at our curriculum we um, look at areas where we feel there are gaps particularly with um, inquiry for, for example and where we are asking students uh, just in one area just to problem solve and dig, uh, dig a little deeper okay. We felt as though we, with our current resource, had an opportunity um, because we do feel like that's an equity issue. There are uh, other resources, of course, because we're asking to adopt one, um, and there are other students in other districts that have access to that content-rich material that really um, leans in and asks them to dig a little deeper, particularly around inquiry and discovery. And so we feel like that's just one uh, instance where you, we can talk about an issue of equity that we feel that this resource will provide an opportunity to fill that, that type of gap so we don't have that. We also, um, in looking at this curriculum, there are more opportunities for experiential learning. There are more hands-on activities. There are more uh, opportunities for students to really uh, get involved with the mathematics and not just uh, grapple with an, ag an algorithm in mathematics. So um, we feel that having a very type of instructional experience around mathematics is um, going to be really rich and deep around our uh, strategic priority one and it also answers um, and deals with questions of equity that we feel we don't have in our current resources. What was your second question? Well, I'm sorry. Um, how, does, how does this curriculum take into account the impact that the pandemic had on students from that? Um, so that's a, a, a harder question for me to ask. I don't know if the curriculum specifically looked at, at the pandemic to say, you know, we're going to make some adjustments or whatever they may have. But I think what was more important is that we looked at our curriculum and realized that in light of the pandemic and even before, that we had opportunities to do something better. And so when you know something better, you of course try to do better. And so we um, knew that this was an opportunity to go into review to leverage the voices of uh, teachers throughout the district in our secondary, you know, in, in secondary, and um, find something that we felt would be better. Um, I think just personally, if you're asking me about math, I mean, I talk about math all day probably, but- What did you teach um, Dr. Bell? I taught math. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think personally, I think that a personally. lot of times, our resources have traditionally not asked um, our students to dig deep and really think critically, um, problem solve in, in, in many ways. And so uh, we feel that this is an opportunity that not only was brought on by the pandemic, it's probably exacerbated by the pandemic, but it's something that should be done again. Thank you. Oh, she wants to add. I'm just going to add on the thank you for that. And I really appreciate the question. I would just like to give an example of what we saw when we were trying out Carnegie in the sense of equity. So we have a, a vision, mission, value, and goal that we stand on that we want all of our math classrooms to have access to high quality learning. And so when we think about equity, we want all of our students to engage with and have an opportunity to touch and feel the math and really learn about math. And so when you think about Carnegie, it's set up in an inquiry base, and that might not make sense because we're used to lectures when you think about math instruction. So 
um, what we saw was that students are given a scenario and they have to, it's entry level. Everyone is, is invited in with that scenario versus a, a classroom where let's review a problem and I've forgotten the rules or the steps or the strategies. And so I might not feel real confident with the, con like the content, but I'm in a collaborative group that requires me to at least enter in and talk about what I know about that situation or scenario. And so then I'm able to talk about it and then I learn from not only my peers, but from my, the way my teacher is asking me questions. So that's another reason why the PD is really important because it's a shift in how our teachers, some of our teachers are currently teaching uh, versus a lecture style or let me show you or tell you how to do the math versus let me let you experience and try and explore. And then I'm gonna ask questions that get to the why behind that algorithm works or behind why that step works or the real math. Instead of the teacher being the expert, it's the students want to learn more. And what, one other thing we learned is that there are multiple ways to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And with the way we've done math traditionally, in many regards, we want one answer. We want the algorithm that Ms. Bellock was talking about. So now we're going to explore the multiple ways that a problem can be solved, which is which will engage students because they can take it from their own approach versus having to do, do it one way. We saw an eighth grade classroom where students were not engaged before trying Carnegie. That same eighth grade classroom with using Carnegie and students who normally have their heads down were all in um, and using like patty paper to create transformations and um, really engaged. I was honestly going to add that, that same thing. Um, I'm one of eight teachers that was on the working uh, group in the beginning. It was one of our, one of the first things that we did was sit down and list what our wants were, what our needs were, and we weren't going to move away from, from them throughout this entire process. And that was definitely one of them. And what we saw at the algebra one level was the same thing. We saw students in, during the trial of, of using Carnegie in the classroom where students, I mean, they, there was a positive response to it, especially from students who we had recognized that had not been, you know, attentive and not been um, working as well as they could have. But when we started introduce, introducing Carnegie, we saw a shift there. So. Are there other school districts in our area that use that currently uses curriculum? Yes. yes, there are um, two larger districts in the St. Louis area, Rockwood and Winsville, use it. And I've talked to both of their curriculum coordinators. Uh, that's just local in the St. Louis metro. Right. If you were to at, look at nationally, uh, there are quite a, there are a lot of schools. Not a lot. I can't put a direct number on it, but more than the other um, curriculum that we were looking. So it's a bigger network, and Carnegie is a large network as well. Thank you. What kind of a lift is it going to be for um, our teachers to, to pivot between what they've been doing in, in this new program? Um, <laughs> like I said, it is a shift, and, but the shift came from within. It wasn't Dr. Bell or myself or our partners saying do this. The criteria really came from within about the wants. Um, and so there are, the buy-in is there. It's the frustration level of I'm not used to it. I, the analogy of a diet, right? Like you're all in, you try it, and then maybe you have a setback, but if you have a coach along the way or you have supports to go to, you're gonna stay on track. And so um, it is, it's a shift because we tend to go back to habits of lecture or I'm just going to tell you because it's way easier. And so that's why, again, the PD and the constant feedback are going to be really important. We did have other teachers that worked within the working group that were also part of the trial. Um, and then we did also have conversations about what we saw during our PLCs. So everyone was in the conversation um, and everybody's excited. But like I said, it's going to be a shift and that's why we want to get started. I'm happy to say I opened up the summer opportunity to anyone who was interested because it's pretty expensive. And uh, 11 people signed up out of, <laughs> <laughs> out of a pretty small, I mean, that's a pretty yeah. high percentage of people to give up time a week in the summer. Any other? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to say that 
Yeah, so this sounds like it fits in well with problematize, is that right? Um, and relevant learning experiences. And I just want to say that my dad taught mathematics at the, at the uh, university level, but I was never big on that uh, myself. And I even had a son who was very talented mathematically. But at one point after he had graduated, he, he, he said, you know, I just about dropped out. I, did, I didn't think anything that we were learning meant, you know, had any relevance. I didn't understand why we needed to learn this. So, and in math, I think, is especially that way for a lot of students because it's kind of abstract when you get to a certain level, especially, right? And so if this inquiry-based approach has more students understanding how important math really can be in all varieties, all aspects of life, you know. I just want to read an article about economics, there's math, you know, and, and, and all kinds of other places. So um, I'm excited. Yeah. So Bill, you did say that um, that the professional development was going to start before the school year ends, and I take it that's going to include all the teachers that will be teaching those grades and our subjects. Yes. So we, uh, Dr. Bell and I, have been meeting with the principals at both the middle and the high school to determine like course placements and to really like so that April 21st we're starting with the course you're teaching for next year. Um, so you're really ahead when you think about your mindset is what you're teaching as well as you can spend as much time as you want this summer going deep. Um, thank you. I just appreciate any time, I mean, it, to me, it speaks volumes to have a teacher who is doing it, right? Because that's where, that, that's all I need to hear is that, is that a group of educators got together. And I love, thanks for explaining the whole process of, of getting it down to two and then selecting it. I mean, you did your due diligence, and if you're excited, we're excited, you know, and that, it, I feel grateful, you know, that you put that work into it. You touched on the teachers and the shift that the teachers have. Tell me what you think um, you expect the shift to be for the students who are used to learning in a particular way, and then that's going to transition. Especially to what did you see when you were when you were practicing? Like, like I said, just a lot more engagement okay. from the students, and um, so I was talking about understanding a lot of our students. They don't understand, but most of that problem is they're not engaged. Yeah. We saw that we were uh, in this trial. <laughs> we saw a lot of students that really have checked out. You know, you know, we keep on about getting involved, but out of nowhere they just turn around. Wait, what is it that we're doing? You know, and, and following along with these problems. And so, in the few classes that we were able to to try this in, it's in communication, we should be getting a lot of it. And I'll add on that vertically, we're really, we've really tried to promote uh, math communities. So um, the math norms and like, how do you see yourself? What's your math identity? And so students are coming into middle school in K-5 with that sense of I can learn and I, you know, I want to be a part of my math community from an inquiry base. And so it's a natural progression into the secondary lens. I think until, you know, the ripples of the years that maybe there has been some more traditional teaching, it's going to be a bad habit, or it's going to be like a bad habit again where you have to, I'm not just going to tell you the answer. I'm not just going to tell you how to. So again, that's, I think it's going to be on both sides, teacher and student, but I think it's also like it's back to the math communities. Mm -hmm. This is what we believe. I agree. I think that there will be bumps in the road with uh, this transition as there are with any transition. Uh, however, I do feel as though um, this honors all of our three pillars. I think that it humanizes uh, mathematics for, for kids. I think it personalizes mathematics for kids because they can enter at their own pace and at their own entry point. And of course, we think that with the deep, rich inquiry, it's going to definitely problematize. So, not going to be perfect, but we definitely feel it's much better than what we have right now. And one last small question, because if not now, when? What do you need to be to feel supported in having this transition happen? Um, I 
I think I think this this PD and professional development is one of the hardest, especially getting started. So <coughs> not waiting until you know, July or August when we come back. Um, so I, I mean, we feel very supportive so far with with how it's been going and this whole process. Um, like I said, I didn't know what I was getting myself into as far as you know back in August and, and being part of the working group, but the steps that we took and the time, just not the times that we met together as a group. School, all the conversations that took place outside of those times, we, we feel as if you know, we're moving in the right direction and that we are supported. So. Yes, I want to thank you for the process and for telling us uh, how you went through it. I'm, I'm really thrilled about the unanimous adoption, and that's, that says a lot um, that you went to a group of people on the ground and Carolyn and bought in. Um, I love the early PD. I know we've touched on that. Um, over my years of teaching, I can't count the number of times I had a new curriculum resource. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it's five or six books, and the stack might be this big. You know, and you have to hit the ground running with that resource, just providing the time to get familiar with the resource before using it. I, I think that's going to really be, really be in our favor. I love that idea. Um, I'm also happy about the alignment from six for all with you. I'm sure you know that I'm a fan of alignment. Um, so I like the potential for aligning curriculum from six through 12. Um, how do you think this will connect with our K-5 curriculum? Our K-5 is already inquiry-based, and so it's a real nice tra transition for our fifth, rising, our rising sixth graders. Looking forward to see, the, see, see how it all works out. I want to hear, hear how it's going. Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we'll go to item 7.3, the new and revised policy PD. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the board voted to rescind policy PDD because the language is embedded in policy PD, but there were some clarifying questions. Um, the first part of DD in the first paragraph of the B policy. And the second piece is in the first paragraph of the budget expenditure section. So the language is clearly done. Any questions? So this is an action item. Can I get a motion to approve policy TV as presented? So Ms. Ryder. Stewart. Any questions or comments? So really, we had kind of duplicate language on two different policies because this isn't even a change that first right. words, right? That's probably why we it's a realization it. of their <laughs> question. Okay. okay, so that's good to know. Thank you. And thank you for kind of tracking down the good question. The, yeah. Appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, thank you, Scott. Scott. With that, we'll move to item 7.4, the Women's History Month Resolution 2023. American women of every race, class, ethnic, and racial background, and sexual orientation have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our nation in countless ways. American women have played and continue to play a critical economic, cultural, and social role in every sphere of the life of the nation by um, constituting a significant portion of the labor force, working inside and outside of the home. American women of every race, class, ethnic, and racial background and sexual orientation served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement. American women have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolitionist movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, and the civil rights movement, and other movements, especially the peace movement, which create a more fair and just society for all. Despite these contributions, the role of American women in history and science has been consistently overlooked and undervalued in the literature, teaching, and study of American history. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the School District of University City recognizes the month of March as Women's History Month and urges all staff, students, and citizens to join in the celebration of Women's History Month and to honor the achievements of women and their contributions to our community, our state, and our nation. Let's give it up for the girls. <laughs>
this is an action item, so uh, can I get a motion uh, for the Board of Education to approve the Women's History Month resolution as presented? So moved, Second, Frank. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, thank you. With that, we'll move to item 7.5, the NCIP 6 update, secondary science support. So um, I do have the MSEP 6 update you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Um, and the update is um, has been shared via um, email and is also on the district website to our public, but wanted to take a moment to um, go through a little bit of the data. Um, there will be other opportunities to engage in conversations. We will dedicate time at the um, middle school and high school community engagement meeting to talk more about the MSEP 6. Many of our accreditation points come from our secondary level. So um, on March 7th, um, the annual performance report, APR, was released. There's no change in our accreditation until 2024. That um, data for 2024 accreditation will include data from last school year, this current school year, and the upcoming school year. Um, this is a part of the Continuous Missouri Assessment Program, MAP. Also, the EOC scores that our students take at the secondary level, and what is called an MPI, or MAP Performance Index, that looks at growth and gives um, districts points for moving students inside of achievement levels. This current year, actually the prior year, 2021, 2022 is a baseline year for accountability purposes, and I want to note that it is impossible to compare MSEP 5, which was the prior um, school improvement program, to MSEP 6. MSEP 5 um, had a weight for MPI, Missouri Performance Index, for four performance levels. They're listed there. Um, the board is aware, and the public may be aware, that myself, along with Dr. Peoples, our um, high school principal and secondary education director have served on the MAC committee, which is the Missouri Assessment Committee, for the last two years. And I have been a part of the MSEP 6 planning committee for the last four years. Um, we were very instrumental in having some modifications to the MPI, and you will see the weights there, which gives a progression of performance between the different levels in lieu of just a one-point um, metric. Another comparison from MSEP 5 to MSEP 6, we did, um, um, we were able to get information regarding climate and culture, also um, continuous improvement, and a heightened focus on board governance and overall leadership. So you'll see areas where MSEP 6, MSEP 5, um, did look at those factors, and then MSEP 6 is now looking at those factors. So, for example, ICAP is um, an assessment for uh, individual career and academic planning for eighth graders that are entering high school to make sure that they have a pro career progression, not necessarily definitively what they plan to do once they leave high school, but some sort of plan. Also, focus on kindergarten readiness. We know that early learners are, are critical, and really it's important to make sure that we have solid plans. Having um, some weight for improvement, school improvement plans, um, responding to standards. Of course, I mentioned co college um, climate and culture. Also, um, this focus on college and career readiness. We have always talked about that in UCB. Mm -hmm. That is a big part of our learning or imagined vision of problematize. Every student is not going to pursue a four year university, so we need to be thinking about career exploration, and that is also included. Our finances are part of the new system. Um, any, um, all of our auditing pieces and making sure that we are compliant with reporting to the state and then of course submitting data in a timely manner. So um, a big change is the performance and continuous improvement. The old MSEP 5 only had um, performance. Now we have continuous improvement, that is 30% of our points. There is this continuous MPI, which is the ranking, the, the, the weight that I showed you. Instead of it being one, two, three, four, five, it has a progression. Um, also, um, the academic growth is heightened. Um, there is status and growth that is weighted. 
Um, and then the actual free and reduced lunch used to be determined by community eligibility. Now it is actually determined by students who are actually certified to receive um, free or reduced lunch. And then the continuous improvement piece is based in over three years. So there are 180 points total. Um, 128 of those are performance. 84 of them are academic achievement. Um, we do not have points yet for science and social studies for growth or student growth. Um, and then um, you will also notice that student group is a new term. It used to be called subgroup. We pushed back. Um, sub has a very negative um, connotation and honestly, it's suppressive. So we um, really advocated for that language to be reflective of equity. And um, our student groups are now called student groups. And that would be students that have an IEP, um, black students, um, students that are EL learners, um, and uh, Hispanic students. And students that have, yes, I get yes, okay. So success ready students is a big part. That's again, that college and career readiness. So there's an emphasis on that. Um, these are not new. Um, we've always had these standards here, a graduation rate, and then of course graduation follow-up. Continuous improvement is new. Um, that is around our improvement plan, um, climate and culture survey, which is new the success ready students, and then um, the timely submission. So phase one is 180 points. Um, phase two um, will have um, some additional points where uh, we will have more points for academic uh, growth. And also in um, for phase three, we will have um, the uh, 200 points that would include the addition of response to standards. So where is the district? Um, we earned for performance 59.8% of the possible points and for continuous improvement 92.3%. So our total APR for this current year is 69.2. Um, we are approaching in um, designations for all academic status areas earning 50%. We earned average designation for ELA. Um, we earned above average designation for math. Um, and 50% of success ready students around CCR and advanced credit. Our six year graduation rate was used, and that's 75%, and then 75% for grad follow up. We got zero points for attendance, um, which was the only place in continuous improvement where all possible points were not earned. I want to give a caveat um, before I go into the data. We are really aiming to understand the growth metric. Um, it is not as clear and transparent as we would like. We are working in tandem with the state to really be able to speak intelligently and clearly um, to how the state is calculating growth, not just for our district, but also districts across the state. Um, under the new system and per statute, districts are ranked across the state. All of the districts, all 500 plus districts have a rank. And as we work in collaboration with our state supervisor and um, the individuals at DESE, we hope to have more clarity on that piece. And so I'm hesitant to really um, speak to the growth, even though we are seeing the growth in our students. But um, I really believe that we need more um, concrete definition regarding the calculation from the state. I also want to point out that attendance is not an area where we expect it to receive points. Um, if you recall, in January of 2022, and also December of 2021, there was the Omicron variant. We were um, very much um, insistent on families and, and teachers, honestly, <coughs> remaining at home if they were sick. We were the only district in our state who maintained a mask mandate because of the vulnerability of our students. So we are already tracking better for our attendance points. Um, so we do believe that we will secure more of those points. If the district had achieved any points for attendance, we believe that we know that we would have mathematically been above 70%. 
Our map proficiency rate is for grades three through eight, and you will see um, the rates there for ELA, math, and science. Our ELC end of course exam is for our high school students in four uh, core content areas, and you will see our proficiency rates there. Um, when we looked at this slide um, last year, we were at about 3% for Algebra 1, so we're seeing significant increases in math, which is why you saw above average growth. Um, we also are seeing um, consistent progress in English, even though we dropped just a little bit. Our um, size of students who actually took the assessment increased by 50%, so we have more students take the assessment, and we're still almost at the state average for ELA. And we have significant work to do for biology and government, and I will speak to biology in a moment. This is how we compare for MAP, um, again, 3 through 8, to other neighboring districts. Um, and you will see where your city um, compares to um, districts in our area. And these are the, the primary districts that we typically compare ourselves to. You will also see how we compare to Missouri. And this is for proficient and advanced. You will see how we compare for math in the area of mathematics and 19%. You will see where we are with um, science in comparison to um, neighboring districts. Algebra 1. English. and then biology. Government. Growth is um, all students, is what you'll see here. And you'll see how we, our growth compares to neighboring districts. So this is where our students start to where, um, how much they grew across achievement levels. And so you'll see our comparisons there for all students. And then you see our ELA growth compared to student group. And I want to note, if one district has one of those groups, they're in a student group. So you could have just one EL student, and that growth is, is here. So again, um, growth is something that we really need to dig deeper around and really need to get more clarity so that we can speak very transparently um, around how the state is calculating that. And I know the state is having conversations as well. Math, growth, compared to our neighboring districts for all students. And then math for um, student group. So in summary, um, this is a baseline. The data is literally a year old. We took the assessment this time last year. We are um, beginning to plan for the uh, MAP assessment and the ELC, ELC assessments for this current year. Um, we believe that based on our benchmark data, um, based on teacher formative assessments, that we are seeing um, progress. The MAP assessment, the ELC assessment, is one point in time. It is one moment, one day and how students perform. And um, the fact that we are continuing an upward trajectory despite a very difficult two and a half years speaks to the resilience of our students first, um, and then our families that support them, and of course, what our teachers do on behalf of them each and every day. So what we are doing to respond to the data is we have high, we have, the board has approved a multi-tier system of support um, leader who will help us refine our innovation systems so that they are consistent across buildings and so that every child has access to effective research-based interventions and it's not left up to chance and then we have a system to monitor that and support that. Um, we also have hired, thanks to the board's um, support, a district therapist to really provide those social emotional support so that students can be in class and they can get um, the mental health supports that they need. It is one person. It is not 
the silver bullet, but it is a step in the right direction. And the next recommendation that I have is for the board to consider um, a secondary science instructional coach, data specialist, and PD facilitator that would focus on providing science, um, professional development, and coaching for teachers, and also be a resource to help with our data analysis and really be a, a, a resource to help teachers at the secondary level hone in on specific metrics and data points that can serve as high leverage um, strategies to move student approved achievement. There is a present, uh, proposal in your packet. Um, it is in board docs. Um, and what I am asking is that the board consider the allocation of that resource. We do have um, the budget to support this um, resource. And when I look at our historical data, with 15% of um, students particularly for biology last year, proficient and advanced, and then 11% for this year. Um, and the significant turnover that we've had in our science department at the high school over the past five years, we have projected three of seven teachers within the department being designated as new for the 2023-24 school year. Um, we believe that this resource is necessary to help advance the work that is happening and just really move the district forward and more importantly uh, give students those rich experiences that they deserve um, in the area of science and science and mathematics are interconnected and those both are content areas that are essential for many of the career exploration opportunities that our students seek so that concludes my presentation I can address any questions but I am asking for consideration for the um, secondary science instructional coach data specialist PD facilitator so this is an action item. Um, so can I get a, uh, a motion to approve the secondary science instructional coach proposal as presented? So moved, Lenard. Second, McDougal. All right, this is a uh, discussion. Any questions or comments? Can, I, okay, so do we want to just discuss this? Can we ask questions about the MSIP too, or how do we want to do this? Both mm -hmm. right yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, just a question. When you, it, it seems so. When you look at the um, social studies end of course comparison, it seems so blatant to me that there's some sort of weird divide going on. Um, in the schools and the data, and I don't know if the state is looking at that, if there was any perhaps cultural bias on the test, because it does look very odd. Like everything else kind of has a little slant to it when you look at it, and this one is like this with the different school districts. And I, it's just a question, you know, like putting it out there, is it something we should, we should kind of question? I know this is a new test. Correct. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. So um, it's not as bad. Not as bad. I mean, because look at the difference between the Missouri average and this, and it's all these schools. Whereas biology. It's biology. Yep. You're right. But anyway, but even that one has a little bit of a slope to it it's really just very obvious on this one and it's a new test so I think it's worth questioning are there any biases on this test you know like any words any strange things going on so because traditionally we have scored near the average on government government has historically been um, a high point for our district right um, there are some other factors that um, around what we can do differently mm -hmm. instructionally. Um, so we, I don't want to, no, you know, what my, yeah, my aim is um, what I think about the data. Um, APR is APR, and I firmly believe when students have rich, engaging, um, authentic learning experiences, APR is a byproduct of that. And, but to your point, when you look at the composition of the districts that are significantly lower than the state average, that does call the question. So I have noted that, and um, I will definitely um, lift that with the MAC committee and with 
um, Susan Hill, who supports our social studies work. Okay, great, thank you. Did you have a question on the other? Okay. Well, I mean, maybe. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Hart and Barkley and Dr. Peoples for service on this MSIC, MSIC 6 revision committee. Um, it looks like the changes are very uh, positive, and I've always felt like this APR was a uh, inequitable uh, situation, an inequitable measure of uh, schools, and it always it always hurt us in public esteem. Every year when this comes out, you know, people look at it and like, why are we failing all these students? Well, we're not, but um, I think that a big improvement to me is focus on growth. And the fact that we're getting points for moving students within the bands of, you know, basic, the low basic, and so on. Because, you know, what we had here was we had precise tests that gave precise amounts, precise numbers of scores for each teacher, each classroom, et cetera. And then you had the state lumping stuff together. And that failed to recognize those students who were making successful growth albeit not crossing that line into the next category. So just thank you for making, uh, contributing to making those changes. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I just lost my question in my head. I did have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does the state have any idea when they're going to look into growth and algorithm and kind of or more transparent of what goes into that exactly? Yes. They are um, having a lot of conversations and um, the data was recently released and we are just now seeing rankings um, and that is a part of the growth model. Uh, so only one district in the state would get 12 because it is, that that's how this, and I honestly, I wish I could sit here and intelligently explain it and I've said it in a ton of meetings and I don't understand it, and I will say that. Um, and I should understand it. And so my, and I'm not saying that it is the state's fault, but I don't. Um, I've had a conversation with our state supervisor. Um, I will be having um, conversations with Lisa, um, who is the new data assessment person for the state, and also Jocelyn Strand, who's been our primary contact person. But it should be crystal clear how growth is calculated. Yeah. And we're not an anomaly. Our other colleagues are looking at this. Joe has read the manual from cover to cover. And honestly, what is in the manual is not how they calculate it. <laughs> so we are really, um, you know, I know this is not a negative. I think this is an opportunity to learn more. I will say that I thank the state for um, considering growth at all. I think that is a step in the right direction. Is it exactly the way that it should be calculated? I'm not sure yet. And I do know that as a district, our status could be higher, proficiency rates should be higher. And, and in some buildings, one building in particular, Flynn Park, um, we need to accelerate the growth of students because Flynn Park's um, lack of growth directly impacted the district's overall IPR. Mm -hmm. And of course, those students who are in that building who did not grow academically. And we need to address that. Any questions or comments with relation to the um, science uh, instructional coach? So this would be a brand new position and um, be paid in comparison to other, like our math instructional coach, coaches yes. and things like that. Yes. And they would be working with both teachers and students or just teachers? The intent would be students and teachers in a coaching capacity, uh, modeling, and providing direct feedback around teacher practice, helping with um, the PLC process, particularly at, in the area of science, but then also um, helping to support this data kind of assessment piece between the middle school and the high school so that the continuity of data and um, conversations around instruction are fluid um, and not dependent on elementary and middle school. Dr. Peoples um, is the person who actually made the recommendation based on his knowledge of supporting um, Brittany Woods and the high school. 
And as we think about some other um, transitions that we will have in the CNI department that we are aware of, we believe that this um, additional support will help to enhance what we already have, but just heighten the focus specifically on science. And the rationale is just, not just at the high school, but we um, had almost all new science teachers at the middle school um, as of last year. So really wanting to have a solid foundation. There is the plan to have a curricular resource adoption at the science level, and I'm looking at Kashina and Bev, so we do need to go through that process as well. High school. So um, that is something that this individual can support as well. Any other questions or comments about the uh, instructional coach proposal? And I will say that I gave the board this late because we have been moving at a very quick pace. If there is concern about approving it tonight, I am happy to bring it back for the board. I do want to note that if we do that, it does impact our ability to secure a quality candidate. But I do understand that the timing of this is not ideal. Um, well, with that, is there is there any concern? voting on this tonight. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and vote on this. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you, Dr. Hardenbarley. And with that, we'll move to item 8.1, the board member reports. And we'll start on the other end. So, George, you're first. Yeah, the only thing I, I have is I did attend uh, the what used to be Passport night is now a world something, and um, I really think it just showed me the benefits of the One U City approach to providing the same opportunity for enrichment activities to students in all the schools. It really amps up the power of the volunteer force to put on a um, more impressive for all and you know the music and the food and everything was there yeah, if, if you didn't go there go there next year because it's going to be even better I'm sure. Thank you George. Bridget? Uh, yes I was also there and it was phenomenal I had I mean there was this world percussion band and also the Our Lady of Guadalupe Dance Ministry was there and that was an incredible experience I thought so um, I've never seen anything like a One U City crew come in and set something up and take it down. I just go for that alone to see that happen. It's an amazing uh, group of volunteers. So very well attended, and so it gave me that pride. I also would like to say that uh, it was clear to me that uh, that the attendees were not representative of all areas of U City. So I think we've got a lot of work to go as far as. Um, continuing to build a community that's really inclusive of all all areas and all neighborhoods. So, um, so that was eye opening for me. The next one community meeting, the, the last, the next and last one U City community meeting is April 11th. Um, so, jot that down on your calendar. And I believe it was scheduled to be at Brittany Woods, but I think there was a location change. I think it's going to be at Barbara C. Jordan. So. Um, just keep an eye out for that. And also, uh, you likely know, but Tuesday, March 28th from 7 to 8.30 at Brittany Woods, Woods Middle School um, is uh, moderated by the League of Women Voters. One U City is going to be hosting a candidate forum for all school board candidates. So um, you can mark that down. Oh. Thank you, Bridget. Over. Okay, I would like to announce that uh, the University City Education Foundation has set a date of April 27th for their fundraising concert and that's going to be held at Blueberry Hill. And I'm hoping that all of us will participate and contribute. There is going to be a silent auction there as well as several bands and one of the premier bands that I'm looking forward to hearing is our U City Jazz Band. I just came and I'll wait. <laughs> Over, are you performing? <laughs> 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 Hi. 
<laughs> You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Old Bird. Uh, Lisa? Um, okay. We had a policy committee meeting and we continue to refine like how we're flowing. Policies are flowing through the district and um, keeping our eyes on that and I'm passing the baton on to the next whoever is going to be the committee chair. Because um, it was my last meeting for, for that. <laughs> Um, also uh, attended the legislative breakfast. Um, the, legislati the legislation, um, Missouri legislation, is on spring break right now, so we have a small breather. Um, open enrollment did pass the House. Um, it will look um, so right now. If you need to focus on in on any representatives, it would be the Senate to ask them to please reconsider this bill because right now, as it stands, um, it looks like really would not be covering equity. I mean, besides the chaos with school finances that would, would happen with it, um, there's no transportation for students. Um, there's no guarantee for special ed, <coughs> believe it or not, which may actually be illegal. <laughs> um, so, um, and some other things in, in the, the, the current form of the bill. Um, plus all the concerns about trying to load athletic teams, um, the money that would have to go into PR to keep kids in your district rather than going to instruction, all kinds of issues in there. So please, um, if you have a chance, just call your senator's office and let them know what you think about that bill. Um, let's see, parent bill of rights in the House. There's some a couple of them, a couple different ones moving. Um, I'll try to keep track of what's going on, and hopefully, um, some of the worst of them are not getting traction, but there's still some kind of moving and we could still have some issues with that. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I think I forgot. The rest. If, if, if anybody else remembers another thing that we really need to pay attention to. Personal property. Personal, personal property tax, yeah. Um, there's some movement on that, but then there, the, the Senate, it got a little jammed up in the Senate because I think some firefighters started to like say, hey, wait a second, we're not gonna have any money. <laughs> And um, that group really influenced the senators and sort of locked up there. Um, and that's about it on that. Um, I went to the Wakanda um, production for Jackson Park. It was a ball house, y'all. There is some good school spirit going on there. So that's fine. Hmm? It was a lot of people. I have never seen that auditorium so much. It was $1.50 a ticket. That's how this in the background is set. It was $2. Well, I had to charge some people $1.50 in advance. I said, you charge $1.50? <laughs> <laughs> it was a full house. It was. Really full house. It was. All right. That's all I got. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Stewart? I also attended the one you see, uh, the culture event that was nice. It was uh, great to see kids talk about their projects and their, uh, their projects. In their time. I, I also attended the legislature breakfast and I've been attending those lunch luncheon. There's a lot of legislature going on. Um, so you gotta keep your eyes open. Uh, the you said April, they got some couple of things coming up. April 15th and 16th, they're gonna do the walk in the woods. April 28th is going to be the plant sale. Well, 28th plant sale on the 29th and 30th. Um, let's see. Uh, something else. I can't think of it. I can't think of it. But you said he, uh, you said he was getting it. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Join us. Uh, yes, Character Plus had a board meeting on February 21st. Um, they're continuing to par partner with local, local school districts to uh, meet the needs of the school districts. They're also spreading out. They've got programming in Illinois and the country of Columbia, and they've been to Africa, so um, character education is a worldwide value. Um, on February 22nd, the Governance Committee met. I know some of our uh, protocols came before us tonight. We're getting close to a, um, a handbook that's just about ready to share with the board. Um, I know we'll be onboarding at least one new school board member 
um, in April. So we'll look to use that. We'll get that. We'll get that rolling and get that in front of you. But these protocols really are helping us. And then we've got a lot of existing protocols. Um, I like to joke that they came up on a tablet from the mount. Um, you know, just when we were all on board as board members, there were these these instructions for us. And so we get three of them. So those are all rolled into that document um, as of now, too. So we'll get that before the board um, in the near future. On March 6th, um, Special School District Governing Council had a meeting. Um, and that was the meeting at which um, the governing board is elected. Um, Yuval Asner from Subdistrict District 7 was re-elected. Um, Dan Caneo from Subdistrict 2 is re-elected. There is an impasse for Subdistrict 1. Um, one of the candidates was um, out of town and was not able to connect in. So an impasse was declared, and so that role hopefully will be filled at the June 5th um, Governing Council meeting. So that seat is still open. And they, that, um, however, Curtis Faulkner, who's currently in that seat, will continue to fill it until, until, June, until June 5th, pardon me. Um, I'm still part of the DESE Early Childhood Education Leadership Hub. Um, we had a meeting in, in conjunction with Kinsman, Missouri. The governor is um, proposing a lot of things for early childhood education. Um, he's proposing $78.5 million in subsidies, $65 million to, to, for pre-K toward um, students who are pre and reduced lunch, $60 million in tax credits um, for companies that are supporting child care. So hopefully we'll see a lot of that movement come through. We all know the importance of pre kindergarten and that there are waiting lists in New City and really everywhere in St. Louis County. Um, and then yesterday we had the Board of Professional Learning Community Planning Committee meeting. Dr. Harden Bartley is part of that committee. Joe Miller is part of that committee. Um, we're planning on a meeting on June 3rd. It will be a Saturday. And our, we're going to look at the impact that statewide movements have on school districts. So what is coming out of DESE, um, MSIP, and MAP, and then um, what is coming out of the Missouri Legislature, how those things will impact us as school districts as we move forward. Um, so that's what I've got. Um, I think I said that meeting will be June 3rd. Um, we're still looking for allocation. We've got a tentative one we have to verify. And I just want to wish everybody a wonderful, safe, and uh, great spring break. Hopefully it'll be a warm one. Thanks. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I, I have nothing um, really to add. I, I attended uh, the governance committee uh, meeting, and then um, also the policy committee, which you know kind of go hand in hand, honestly. Um, but uh, I also attended the uh, Wakanda um, play. I just wanted to thank Jackson Park for putting on such an incredible production. We have some of the stars here tonight: Dr. Bell, Dr. Harvey Barwin. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just, it was incredible. So um, a shout out to them for putting that on. I hope the other schools can, can do something like that. Because my, my daughter went and saw her friends, her Jackson Park, Park friends uh, in the play. And I, I think all the kids from the different schools would love to be in something like that. So um, I, I hope that that can happen. But other than that, I have nothing else. And with that, we'll move to item 9.1, the upcoming meeting announcements. Okay, um, we will not have a board session meeting in April, but we will have a regular scheduled board meeting April 13th, uh, starting at 7 p.m. Thank you, Gilbert. Uh, with that, we'll move to item 9.2, the motion to adjourn. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion by Second by Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All in favor? All right. Thank you everyone for coming today. Appreciate it. Thank you for the board recognition. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the board.